morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the first uh, grand rounds of the 21-22 academic uh, year. Um, hopefully you've all had an opportunity to take uh, some time off this summer. And we always like to start grand rounds uh, season with uh, just a little update in terms of what's happening within the department. Of course, I will get the opportunity to meet with many of you individually and a lot of you at your divisional rounds that I'll be sort of uh, coming around to say hello at. Um, but this is just a, a sort of overall overview, I guess. So with that, next slide, please. Um, if you know, just want to start with our um, territorial acknowledgement, we respectfully acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to enrich our vibrant community. And with that, I'll just remind folks that September 30th is declared um, holiday at the university in recognition of, uh, of truth and reconciliation. So just a reminder to, to get your orange shirt that day. Um, our objectives this morning are quite simple. We're basically going to provide an update on the current uh, departmental structure, outline some of the challenges and opportunities the department is facing across all the care pillars, and then hopefully have some time to discuss uh, the plan for developing priorities. Um, I, hopefully we'll have enough time to uh, leave for questions, but uh, I haven't actually timed this out, so um, we'll do the best that we can. Um, so always a good idea to start by reminding folks that we do have our mission, vision, and values that have been um, in place for some time. Um, so, of course, our mission is to improve the health and health care of current and future generations through excellence and innovation in education, research, and clinical care. And then our vision is, of course, to be recognized for innovative education, research, and clinical care resulting in better health and health care locally and globally. I will say that um, we are embarking on a strategic planning exercise over the coming months. Um, obviously, over the last uh, 18 months since I've been in this position or so, um, it's, it's been uh, a bit difficult to get things going from that perspective, but um, there are plans uh, over the new, few, next few months um, to uh, begin the exercise. We actually do have uh, already a planning committee and have a bit of a project charter started. Um, the question is how much we're gonna be able to move on that, um, but I'm feeling optimistic that hopefully we'll be able to give a, a bit of a refresh and a reboot to our, our mission and, and our, our um, strategic plan. So with that, um, our values, of course, are, uh, you know, across the, the various uh, uh, parameters, leadership, integrity, respect, and caring as the hallmark of our inter interactions. And I think that now more than ever is important to identify um, collaboration, collegiality, and teamwork in our approach to teaching research and patient care. And you'll see certainly on the administrative pillar that that will be uh, reflected in this morning's rounds. But I've seen, you know, as I've gotten to meet you all for at uh, annual report time, that you have truly embraced that. And it, once again, during these um, challenging times, an important uh, value to identify. Uh, partnerships, uh, which are obviously always going to be the basis of all our relationships with various organizations that we deal with, whether it's within the university, um, within uh, our health authority or um, broader community. And then transparency and public accountability in our decision making. And you know what I always say is all we can do is give the information that we have and sort of the thinking behind the decisions that are made. Um, don't always have control over things, but we can be transparent and um, you know at least go through what the thinking was behind why we did what we did. Um, and then, of course, evaluation and continuous improvement of, of all we do. And, that, and to that end, that's, that's the, the strategic planning exercise that we're planning to undertake in the coming months. 
I'll just start off by um, doing a, a little introduction, I guess, of our team. Um, of course, uh, you know, this is a large, large department. Our department is, is slightly larger than, than um, uh, some faculties. Um, and there is no way that one person um, or even a couple of people can undertake all the work that needs to be undertaken. And so to that end, you know, I've said it repeatedly and, and I'll say it again, is our team is at the center of everything that we do. And this job, in my opinion, cannot be done um, without, without the folks that are around you. So we're very fortunate to have that. So of course we have our academic deputy chair, Dr. Adrian Wei, who was kind enough to cover for me this past summer when I was able to take a couple of weeks off um, uh, relatively quietly. Um, so thank you to Adrian for that. And Elaine Yakishin, who's our deputy department head. Um, I know it says interim there, but it's not interim. It's actually the permanent. So we need to change that. Um, and our ambulatory lead. And she'll be giving a little clinical update on, the, on that perspective. And then, of course, we've got our associate chairs, who um, I will introduce in a minute, um, and our division directors, and then, of course, our administrative leads, who I will also introduce, and all of these individuals. So the big sort of um, steering committee for um, the departments lie within the three uh, committees that are outlined there. So there's our, our immediate executive committee that meets every two weeks. Um, there is the, the steering committee, which is the academic arm of the department. And then there's the zone clinical department executive committee, which is the clinical arm of the department. And what I haven't added there is we do have a biweekly uh, division directors um, get together. Basically, it started um, at the start of the pandemic, at the start of my term in this role. Um, but it's been a really positive um, sort of um, opportunity to exchange uh, concerns, ideas, share best practices, and so on. So that group has continued to meet and will continue to meet. I tortured the division directors by setting it on Fridays at four o'clock, unfortunately. Um, starting today, we, we took the summer off, but we will be getting uh, starting that up again. So that would be the fourth uh, sort of executive committee that meets. So the division directors, this truly is um, a heroic group of individuals without whom this, this uh, department, um, both on the academic and the clinical side could not run. There has been a lot of shifting and movement uh, with regards to our division director um, leadership. So just to update um, the department, we've had three internal reviews uh, take place this, this year, this last academic year in 2021. Um, including uh, the Division of Infectious Diseases, the Division of Geriatric Medicine, and the Division of Dermatology. And I am delighted to report that all three um, divisions are, are excelling and thriving, and we undertook a quality improvement exercise, and all three division directors have agreed to uh, one additional term. So um, that's a great piece of news as far as I'm concerned. Um, you will see that there are a number of individuals there that have interim next to their names. So we're hoping that this coming year, um, we're able to get those positions filled. Um, so it's uh, starting off with cardiology. We've had Dr. Kalaragi step up to act as interim director for the outgoing Dr. Wayne Timchuk, who served in that role for, I think, a decade or maybe more. Um, and uh, the surgeon selection is very much underway for that one, and, and uh, we're, we're making good progress. Um, and then in endocrinology, we've got Dr. Jacques Romney, who stepped into the interim role for the outgoing uh, Dr. Peter Sr., who has taken on a new leadership role as director of the Alberta Diabetes Institute. And so Jacques's been serving in that role um, uh, uh, amazingly. And, uh, and again, we have a search and selection going um, for that position. Um, and then for general internal medicine, we did split up the roles of academic and clinical. So because of 
you know, the pandemic and everything that was going on and so on, it's, it's really, uh, really felt that it needed to, to have uh, a significant help on both sides. And so to that end, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Raj Padwell, who's taken on the role of Academic Division Director, and Dr. Brian Wurzba, who's taken on the role of Clinical Section Chief and has really taken a big load um, for the department. So thank you to you both. And thank you to Peter Hamilton, who of course is um, in his early retirement stage. Um, and then lastly, we've got uh, an active search and selection going for the Division of Neurology. And so to that end, uh, Dr. Zakodny has kindly agreed to continue serving in in uh, an ongoing basis until, until we have that replacement. So just an opportunity to thank him. And then of course, we had a couple of, uh, uh, of uh, well, an incident um, that re resulted in, in some additional leadership changes, which is that Dr. Chester Ho has actually taken on the role of interim zone clinical department head for the uh, Department of Neurosciences. And so with all of the, the hats that Chester wears, I don't know how he manages to fit them all. Um, we thought that it would be wise to have uh, uh, some help in within the division uh, leadership. So to that end, I'd like to thank Nigel Ashworth and uh, Ming Chan for um, acting uh, interim uh, uh, division directors uh, and section chiefs in, in that um, division of physical medicine and rehab while Chester fills the role of the zone clinical department head. Um, so a lot of leadership changes. And you know, the one thing I will say, I did not appreciate how intensive these um, leadership position um, sort of handovers and extensions and search and selections are of course, in the middle of a pandemic, and then, you know, running into the summer. So, um, you know, I, I just want to take this opportunity to, to thank everybody that has participated in the reviews and the search and selections and so on. Um, you know, we're getting better at it. And as we move along and figure out how to do things during uh, a pandemic, hopefully we'll get um, quicker movement on, on these positions. So um, just a little update that way. Um, so then the immediate leadership. So as I mentioned, um, there is Dr. Adrian Wei, who is our deputy chair and associate chair for faculty affairs. Um, and then Francois has uh, taken on, uh, is in the role of assistant chair. Now, um, you will hear from Francois later about the SET initiative and we have moved forward within the department. So we know that uh, Francois is staying in uh, the department in, in the so-called new role of, of uh, uh, department manager. So I'm happy to report that. Um, and then of course, Elaine Yapishin, who is our um, deputy uh, clinical department head who has um, got uh, under uh, sort of her wing uh, and help from our manager for clinical manager, um, Stacy Morehouse for the Department of Medicine um, and for our AMHSP arrangement. And many of you will know her immediate administrative clinical manager, Phil DeLuca, um, who has uh, sort of taken on the lead of, of looking after all of our clinical administrative staff. I was neglectful in mentioning that under Francois, of course, we've got our two divisional administrators, Susan Tiller and Rayanne Barkhouse, who are basically tasked with uh, looking after all of our um, it, uh, academic administrative staff, including our executive um, administrators. And then of course, there is our 13th floor staff. Most of you will know um, and, and you know, be familiar with Eleni and Orlean and Gloria, without whom I can honestly say that this job is not doable. So just uh, once again, um, thank you to our um, administrative team who uh, really do help all of us, but particularly me in fulfilling this role. And of course, I'm neglectful in mentioning Andrea, who's doing our um, uh, slide presentation and, and looks after all of our, our events. So thank you, Andrea, um, as well. And then um, our associate chairs um, for uh, research and education and, and faculty development. So of course, Evangelos 
has been carrying uh, the load from uh, the research perspective. And he's got Gopi and Nadia, uh, who are our directors of graduate studies. Um, and you will hear from Evangelos later in terms of what's happening on the research side. And then Vijay, who is continued the role of education, but added faculty development to that, um, has uh, uh, and, and has support, of course, from Stephen Cates, who's our postgraduate director, and our newly minted undergraduate director, Rebecca Lee. And then, of course, we added a new position this year, um, the Director for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, who Janice, uh, which Janice Miyazaki has kindly agreed to take on. And you will be hearing a little bit later from her as well. OK, and then I would be neglectful if I did not mention our medicine site chiefs, um, the really the clinical load of the COVID pandemic has been carried by these individuals and their um, individual site leads. So um, a hearty thank you on, on behalf of Albertans, I think, but particularly on behalf of the department and myself to Jay Varghese from the Grey Nuns, Dan Slabu from the Misericordia, Winnie Sia at the Royal Alec, Hernando Leon um, at the Sturgeon, and Fraulein Morales at the university site, um, uh, who took on this role during the pandemic. I'm happy to re report that despite all of the challenges that I'm sure you well know about, we have been able to um, uh, realize a growth in our workforce. So to that end, um, we've added four academic faculty who I will introduce in a second, 29 clinical academic faculty, which includes 28 clinical lecturers and a secondary clinical lecturer and uh, six other physicians and locums and so on um, across the, the zone. So the academic faculty, um, ju uh, just you know, full, full uh, uh, um, transparency, two of them came on during the 2021 academic year. And then one of them was July 1st, 2021. So technically this academic year and one in August of 2021. So I'd just like to introduce you to Dr. Peng Wang, who is an assistant professor in the division of hematology. Um, he, most of you will know that he did most his training um, at the University of Alberta, and he conducts uh, most of his uh, uh, research in, in cancer care. Um, and then Vanessa Meyer Stevenson, who is an assistant professor that joined us in May of 2021. She has a PhD in computational uh, medicinal chemistry, and she's in the division of infectious diseases and conducts research on chronic viral hepatitis and study of viral host pathogenesis for this and other viruses. And then um, July 1st, we had Dr. Paul Forsyth, who joined us. Um, he comes uh, originally from Ireland, but joined us from McMaster most recently. And he is uh, now the holder of the AstraZeneca Canada Chair in Asthma and Obstructive Lung Disease. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Frank Cochin, who joined us on August 16th in uh, of this past, I guess, last month. Um, he is in the division of gastroenterology. He comes to us from the Netherlands, so we're adding to our Netherlands contingent. Um, he's a gastroenterologist whose uh, research and clinical focus is in inflammatory bowel disease. So welcome to all these folks. So I wanted to mention that uh, all of our new faculty are going to be highlighted or are required to be highlighted, if I may say so, in our Profiling Our pe People um, segment of our newsletter. So just a plug in for our newsletter. I hope you've had a chance to, to look at it. Um, it's one of those emails that you get on a weekly basis. We're really trying to uh, make sure that it's addressing your needs. Um, obviously, we have to be careful in terms of content uh, that, you know, there isn't uh, 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 privacy breaches and things like that. But to that end, um, we, we have been trying to keep you updated on what's happening. Um, I really enjoy doing my, my little messages on Monday morning with different backgrounds. And um, the really the big highlight has been the profiling our people. So if you haven't already gotten your profile in, please do so immediately. And uh, I think Lisa is going to put up a link on how to do that. And then, of course, we released our 2020 annual report um, that you can see Lenora is on, on the cover of. 
um, it, again, just highlighting all the amazing work that was done this year um, with regards to uh, forwarding our, our academic and clinical mission. So I hope you've had a chance to browse through that. We didn't do paper copies this year because of the pandemic, um, but it's available on our website and has been widely circulated. We've gotten amazing feedback on it. So thank you. So we're now going to move over to our clinical updates. Um, and before I hand it over to Elaine, um, I had really hoped that uh, this year for Medical Grand Rounds, I wasn't going to be having to give um, COVID updates as I had been over the, the 2021 year. But of course, that wasn't meant to be because of wave four. And so to that end, I'm actually going to start the clinical update with uh, a little bit about what's happening with the COVID situation. Here we go. Um, you can see that um, this is the, the actual COVID-19 cases in Alberta. We're seeing an upswing since August 15th. Um, we, all, we know that restrictions were uh, lifted as of July 1st, so um, not completely unexpected despite what, uh, what uh, has been said, um, but um, here we go. So the, the Total numbers are increasing, um, you can see in, in pink there, and uh, our active cases, which is sort of the, the immediate um, concern, are have started to go up. So this is uh, the, uh, a slide just outlining the variants, and we know that the vast majority of this um, uh, wave is uh, the Delta variant, uh, the so-called uh, B1617. Um, as opposed to previously, we know in wave one, it was predominantly the, the wild strain. And then, you know, we had the UK variant during wave three. Um, this is a story of the Delta variant. So next, um, be neglectful and not mentioning the vaccine story. So in terms of vaccinations, um, you can see that we were doing pretty well. We were all really excited. There was lots to look forward to in the spring as the vaccines were becoming widely available. Our vaccination rates were going up. And coincidentally, when the announcement for about the opening for summer was made around, uh, I guess it was towards the end of May, you can see that unfortunately our vaccine rates started to, to go down. Coincidence or not, I'll let you be the judge of that. Um, but unfortunately, we have stagnated and we're sitting at about 60, 65-ish percent of our Alberta population being completely vaccinated with both doses. So sorry, here we go. 67% are have received one dose and 60% are fully vaccinated as of this week. So the story of vaccination is definitely a geographic story and a demographic story. So you can see here that, um, you know, the, the, the urban sites, Edmonton and Calgary, have quite good rates. In fact, you know, if you look at a, a county like St. Albert, I think we're leading the country in terms of our vaccination rates. But what's really worrisome is, of course, to the north and certain, you know, smaller um, uh, suburban rural districts of, of the province where the vaccination rates really um, haven't seen uh, sort of the levels that we need them to be at. And uh, subsequently, we've uh, ended up with this uh, wave four as a result. Um, this is Edmonton, again, you know, pretty good. You can see the outskirts that, you know, we're sitting at about 40 to 60 percent, but at least within the the uh, sort of core area, um, sitting at 60 to 80 percent vaccination, fully vaccinated. Okay, so this is now our hospitalizations. So you can see that since about mid-August, um, just, you know, sort of coupled with um, the increased uh, uh, rates in, in the community, we started to see a rise in our um, hospitalization rates. Um, what's really troublesome about this wave, so-called wave four, is you can see that we're getting close to our peaks, not quite there yet in terms of the, the medicine inpatient um, uh, numbers. So we're probably at about two thirds of our highest numbers, which were, we reached in um, early January or so. But our ICU numbers are tracking up and they are almost at 
if not at what, where we were during our highest peaks. And of course, that's where you know, you're hearing um, concerns with regards to overwhelming the healthcare system. So this is our actual numbers in Edmonton. We've got currently, as of yesterday, 218 total uh, patients in hospital, of which 66 in, are in our, our ICUs. And again, you know, just it lower down, you can see the demographics, a completely different demographic than what we had definitely seen in wave one and to a certain extent in wave two. This is, this is an illness of the, the sort of mid younger age population, 45 to 64 year olds. Um, and uh, here this uh, representation of uh, the fact that this load is being shared across the entire zone. So this also has been called the pandemic of the unvaccinated. And, you know, without going into too much detail, you can see here that the vast majority of individuals, both in the ICU, set, uh, sorry, non-ICU settings or on the medicine wards, as, but particularly in ICU, is a disease of the unvaccinated. And the ones that do fall into that blue category of having completely vaccinated, the vast majority of those are either in, you know, the, the um, uh, more senior age category or uh, patients with other comorbidities. Um, so, you know, you're, you're going to get a more fulsome update, I think, next week when we have our, our return to the fall COVID rounds. But um, this is sort of a, a, an initial picture of what's going on. So what's to come? This is our inpatient medicine early warning system. And currently you can see that since about mid-August, we've been tracking on this steep curve. And so the black curve, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow or not. So um, the, the, the steep black curve. And um, the, if you look at sort of the red area, um, that, that is really what the big concern is, is that's what our numbers are going to look like if we continue tracking at this rate. And there were some, some restrictions announced on, on last Friday. Um, you know, we're all hopeful, of course, that that will have some impact, but um, there is a lot of worry about where this is taking us. So our current state, um, the university site has... Um, 26, this was as of yesterday, 26 inpatients, two and a half teams that are active, a uh, number of units on outbreak. The Royal Alec is tracking about the same. The Misericordia has currently got 30 inpatients um, with one and a half to two teams that are active. And the Grey Nuns is sitting at 15 with one team active. And the Sturgeon has a mixed unit with currently 14 patients, but continue on. So these are just the patients on the medicine unit. I've not included the patients in ICU here. So, oh, sorry, go back to the other slide, please. So just, you know, a call out at this stage. I just want to let folks know if you haven't already heard from your section chiefs and your division directors that we are going to need all hands on deck. This wave four is very much different, both, you know, from the quantity perspective, I guess, you know, we're sort of tracking numbers similar to, to wave two or getting up there, but particularly from a quality perspective. So some of the supports that we had during wave one and wave two, and to a small extent, wave three, have really um, dwindled down. Um, and there is a significant amount of healthcare fatigue, particularly physician fatigue and nursing fatigue. And so, you know, we're going to be calling on all hands to help out with this whether it's support on the COVID units. Um, most of the sites have started a nighttime coverage. And to that end, I need to take this opportunity to thank our senior R5 uh, residents and fellows who have really carried the, the, the load here during our peaks and helped us out with nighttime coverage. Um, announcements should be coming up out soon um, about uh, our, what's called the pandemic response unit. It's now called the surge response unit, which is uh, getting prepared to potentially open. Um, I, I have a strong feeling that it, we will need it this time. It's at the K Edmonton Clinic, not at the Butter Dome on this occasion. And so we're getting prepared for, for that uh, to open. It'll provide 36 beds. Um, and again, uh, for, for you'll hear from your section chiefs and division directors, 
we need backup rosters on backup rosters on backup rosters. Backup rosters for your primary services and backup rosters for COVID support. And then um, I guess with that, I will hand it over to uh, Elaine to update on ambulatory services and the impact. But before I do that, um, just for those of you that are anxious about having to serve on a COVID unit or, or you know, needing help, just a reminder that we do have our COVID website on our Department of Medicine um, primary website. There's a link there and we are trying to keep information as updated as possible. So with that, I'll hand it over to Lee. Thanks, Norman, for the update. Um, basically, just in terms of current state from what you've heard, I also attend zone ambulatory meetings. And with that, there's redeployment of nursing staff to the emergency room and the ICU, just to ensure that um, capacity is maintained. Um, so for ambulatory, specifically for K Edmonton Clinic, we'll continue to see um, our ambulatory pa patients. At the moment, there's not been a call for reduction in capacity. If you need to see your patients as a physician, that's your discretion. However, it's recommended to continue to see your patients virtually as possible. Um, I do have highlighted up on the slide, Connect Care Wave 4, as most of you has, have received the information, it's delayed. And so we'll receive information further in terms of when that will be that will be happening. And finally, in terms of the Edmonton Zone Medical Quality Council, which is our SCIC group or the Strategic Clinical uh, Improvement Co Committee, um, things are going very, very well. And I just wanted to highlight that we also have a website uh, which has uh, publications, newsletters, other information there in terms of what's happening with QI. And a shout out to Pam Thura, who really keeps everything on track with that. And we've seen significant numbers of completed uh, QI projects, which are happening, which has been really exciting to see. So just a very quick update. Thanks. I think we've got Evangelos on the line, but we actually taped his uh, presentation. Thank you, Narmin. Um, one would expect that in a pandemic, the research productivity would have dropped. As I'm going to show you, there's a surprisingly good performance in our department. Here is our funding for research um, broken down by endowments and CHR grants and answer grants and government uh, grants, etc. And you can see it for the past uh, few years, you can see that there is a, uh, a trend to increase um, funding for research in our department that is significant compared to the last uh, couple of years. Um, when you uh, look at the truck council funding, and this is millions, um, now you will see um, our department is here. Um, you will see how we compare with other major uh, research departments and institutes like the MMI or the Department of Oncology or Pediatrics or Biochemistry. Uh, even though um, uh, PMR, um, <clears throat> according to the university, is still a separate department and they break down their official uh, budget separately. But you can see that we are far ahead from any other department, including large departments um, at the university. Uh, in addition, we had a significant rise in the funding uh, for our students, graduate studentships, CIHR and NSERC, you see here um, um, uh, the past few years. So these are the uh, postdoctoral and graduate uh, studentships for PhDs and masters, track council funded. I want to take an opportunity here to remind everybody of the new policy of the uh, university to uh, CHR grants. If you go to the Faculty of Medicine um, uh, research uh, page, you will see these resources for faculty and you will see the new procedures that, I'm gonna, that are going to be applied starting next CHR rounds, that's this coming spring. Um, the first run was just completed for the internal review of all CIHR and Tri-Council grants. 
Um, this internal review process is mandatory, as you can see here, for researchers who have uh, not previously received CRHR funds as a principal applicant, but received startup funding from the university or their department. And it's strongly recommended for everybody. So you can see the procedures on how to do that uh, there. I will also remind everybody to pay attention to the monthly email that you receive from the RSO that lists all the funding opportunities as they come every month. The reason that this is important is that it not only shows you of new and unexpected funding opportunities, but it also outlines the new procedures. And a lot of procedures, a lot of procedures around grant submission have changed mainly because of the cutbacks of the personnel at the um, RSO, at the research office. Uh, there are fewer people reviewing grants, so therefore most of the deadlines are now strict, the internal deadlines, and are earlier than before. So to avoid any surprises, make sure that you check this every month and comply to the internal deadlines and the internal procedures. Um, this is a good momentum that we have in the department, as you saw with our funding success, and we need to improve it further. So as I said, this is from the link to the Faculty of Medicine Research, and we are copying that link now for you on the chat box on the Zoom um, interface that you can find it and save it and follow it from now on. Um, this is the clinical income. This is data from um, uh, uh, NACTRAC. And um, this is the number of trials every year for the past several years. And the total funding. It's interesting that the total funding almost equals that of our, tr our trial council funding. So it's a very good balance between clinical trial funds and original research non-industry uh, uh, funds. Um, there is a small decrease, but in the number and the amount compared to just three years or four years ago, but pretty much we're stable and this is substantial. Here are um, uh, Canada research chairs. We have several tier one and tier two chairs. We have some uh, new chairs like um, 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 uh, AIHS uh, chair in cardio oncology. And the past couple of months, Padma Call is the newest addition in our. Um, uh, funded faculty by chairs, having two different um, endowed chairs, one by the CHR, or Sex and Gender Science Chair in Diabetes, and one by the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Alberta, a, a remarkable achievement. Um, you also have uh, here a list of our ongoing uh, endowments. Um, several faculty members have endowments either uh, endowed by industry, like the AstraZeneca uh, chair that we, we just uh, hired, Dr. Paul Forsyth, that just started this uh, month, or ongoing chairs uh, funded by the Alberta Health Services, uh, several examples of which you can see here. The most important uh, things of what I had to say are the last two slides because it shows our impactful publications. And these are two slides full of uh, pretty impressive uh, papers. You can see here the faculty members, uh, these are either first or corresponding authors uh, and the title of the paper and the journal and the impact factor of the journal. So these are the best of the best journals, Nature Medicine, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, um, and multiple divisions are represented in GI, cardiology, uh, geriatrics here, um, uh, Adrian Wag, um, neurology, um, and 
and so forth. Um, I have to tell you, I've been here um, uh, essentially 20 years, and I've been following, and I don't think I had many years to remember so many uh, impressive publications from our department at this kind of journals. And you can see just, just by the, the impact factors of these journals, how gigantic they are. I'm saying that as a motivation because we are also trying to change the way we uh, promote our work and inspire our new recruits and particularly the junior faculty to publish in higher impact journals, uh, which we are trying through our steering committee to um, somehow quantify. And this is just an example of how uh, our own department members do publish in journals that are at that level. And it should serve as a motivation and an, as an inspiration for all of us. Um, that's all I had to say. It's a good momentum and impressive performance of our uh, department members. You should all be proud of our department. Um, thank you, Norm. Thanks, Evangelos. Um, yeah, I, you know, when I get to meet with people with, for their AROs, it's really remarkable how resilient and how people have been able to pivot. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to BJ. Great. Thank you, Norman. So I first just want to put a heads up that in two weeks today, we have Dr. Eric Warren from the uh, University of Cincinnati, who is quite an expert in competency-based uh, medical education and the role in the U.S., um, doing our AM Edwards Grand Rounds. And you can see the title there, Tell Me I'm Great, How Poor Assessment Practices Makes Us Unsafe. And I think it's really important. I think a lot of you who've filled in tons of EPAs know there's this kind of need to tell the residents they're totally independent when you're not quite sure you're there yet. And so I strongly encourage everyone to come out to that Grand Rounds that will be remotely. I want to begin by thanking Steve Caldwell for his endless support of our undergraduate medical education program. As you can see there, Steve's been involved for 11 years, and he's actually not fully done. He's continued to agree to uh, support uh, Dr. Lee as she takes on her role and is still very involved with the MD program. So again, I do want to thank Steve for all his dedicated service over these years. And again, welcome to Rebecca. So Rebecca will be taking on the role. Again, you see slight changes to the names, Director of Undergraduate Programs. She's already hit the ground running and is on top of what's going on with clerkship assessment. And as well, we'll be looking to the future uh, as a lens to expand the role a bit, looking at the Department of Medicine's involvement in pre-clerkship. Thank you again, Rebecca. So as you've seen from the Pulse updates and my videos and announcements, we are rolling out competency based in the MD program. Uh, very similar approach as postgrad, but obviously different frame of reference. I know we struggled to decide, should we really be doing this now? We're in the middle of a pandemic. There's so many changes. There's so many cuts. Um, at a national level, the expectation is we had to be fully launched by next summer. And so this was our last year to get the form in the hands of everyone. I know it's a time of growing pains and I'm fielding tons of emails from teachers and uh, students over the last several weeks. But I would just say that actually just looking at the first few weeks of the rollout, it's actually going quite well. We're at about uh, 60 to 80% of our targets that we were hoping for. And I think that's great, just a few weeks into a new educational endeavor. I will just say, if you have questions, please feel free to email me. We are asking students to do three EPA attempts a week, which sounds high, but only one needs to be done by you, the attending physician. But again, if you enter it, hit any problems with that, please let me know. And if you're looking for teaching opportunities in the MD program specifically, especially in pre-clerkship, again, barring major changes with uh, the pandemic, we have gone back to full in-person teaching in the physical exam course. So if you are interested, please give me a shout. Now, a quick update about faculty development. These are the various things that uh, I help oversee. Um, for the annual report, if you have questions, please reach out to me. I know there's been some changes in terms of reporting of teaching half days, and so I can answer questions about that. I help oversee the mentorship program with fantastic help from Gloria. Um, and actually, through that as well, I have the wonderful opportunity to meet all the new faculty, the four academic faculty that you've already seen. 
Um, if you have questions about promotion packages as well, I'm here to support and I often review many of the packages and give feedback. And if you're just looking for opportunities for faculty development, both in the department as well as outside through the, across the FOMD, please come to me. And the last thing that I wanna say is a bit of a plug. Um, one of the things when I took over faculty development a year ago is I saw a need for a time management series. We have had experts like Derek Puttister come out to give these workshops. Um, and he kindly agreed to allow me to use some of his materials. And so I am now running um, a series or actually a standalone session for time management. Uh, the first few have just been on an ad hoc basis for the assistant professors. So if you're interested, regardless of level, assistant, associate, full professor, or clinical faculty, um, and you're, you're really struggling with time management, send me an email. I'm kind of tailoring it, trying to make it small groups, about six, and I'm kind of scheduling it around your needs. So just send me an email if you're interested in this. Last thing, we do continue our clinical teaching series through the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. You've seen the updates in the Pulse. Um, but again, if you can't make the dates and you're interested, again, send me an email and there's the website for the FOMD's Faculty Development Calendar. Thank you. Thanks, BJ. Um, so next, I would like to introduce our inaugural director for equity, diversity and inclusion. And she's going to give us a short update on what she's been doing in the short time she's been in the position. Thanks, Janice. Thanks, Norman. Uh, and so I began this position in April. And as you know, there's been a lot of changes in North America. And you can see that all these examples are actually from Canada. Um, so there are still equity, diversity, and inclusion issues, even in Canada, the most multicultural country in the world. This is our EDI work. Uh, working group and uh, thank you to them for uh, really participating, reviewing and uh, forming what's going to be the future of EDI and the Department of Medicine. So I'm just going to go over the results of the University of Alberta faculty-wide survey because many of you may have filled this out four years ago. Um, we only, uh, they only uh, surveyed academic faculty at the rank of assistant, associate, or professor, and so our clinical academic colleagues were not included, nor were our staff included. So these are selected results from the Department of Medicine data. Just to give you an idea of how the uh, response rate was, unfortunately, the Department of Medicine had the lowest response rate with 34% of invitees responding. So 65% were men, obviously 35% were women, uh, pardon my math. 58% uh, of respondents were men, but 42% were women. And so um, the survey results characterize the typical Department of Medicine individual as a white, able-bodied, heteronormative man or woman in a married or common law relationship, fluent in English, but likely to manage a conversation in another language and unaffiliated with organized uh, religion. That's a pretty narrow description. And I think even looking on the Zoom links, you can see that that maybe doesn't represent us fully. So if you don't see yourself in the above description, please help us represent you better. Um, the ethnicity of our department was 27% reported being a different ethnicity than white Caucasian compared to the rest of the university and the faculty of medicine and dentistry. So we are more diverse on an ethnic basis. But the proportion of those identifying as another ethnicity other than white Caucasian declined as the rank increased. And that is concerning and something that we would like to get more data on. And therefore, our group has decided that doing a survey is going to be important of the entire faculty, uh, faculty including both the AMHSP and tenure track uh, faculty, as well as the clinical uh, academic colleagues. We want to also develop guiding principles to outline the EDI activities for the coming years for the Department of Medicine to really guide us and see where we're going to. And after the survey, the quantitative survey, we're going to um, ask for volunteers 
for qualitative interviews regarding your experiences in the Department of Medicine. That includes both on the academic side as well as your clinical work experience. So please participate. And that survey is going to be coming out in the next month. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact me and that's my email. Thank you. Um, thanks, Janice. Janice has really uh, taken this on with vigor and thank you to the committee for all, all of their work. And I really look forward to, to things, uh, things to come from that committee. Um, with that, I will hand it over to Francois to give us an administrative update. Thank you, Dr. Kassam. Um, this first slide is something that I hope everybody is very uh, comfortable with and has seen many times before. Uh, this just outlines the new college model that came into effect uh, July 1st of 2021. And as noted, we are part of the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry in the College of Health Sciences. Um, there is lots of regular information that is provided on the academic restructuring and set. Uh, if, you, if you review your emails every Thursday, uh, the quad usually has a UAT and set update. Uh, there have been many ask set anything sessions with another one coming up for uh, student services on September 17th from 11 a.m. to noon. And of course, there's the conversations with the Dean where Dr. Hemelgarn provides updates on the impacts to the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry itself. So specifically with respect to the Department of Medicine, there have been uh, some impacts that we have started to feel. Um, I think we're a little bit behind many other uh, faculties and departments in some ways, but various things have started to happen and uh, changes are beginning to occur. So in the first area, we have the assistant chair administration, as Dr. Kassam mentioned earlier. These positions have been reclassified as academic department managers. Uh, 10 out of the 12 academic department managers in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry have been identified. When the final two positions are filled, uh, a formal announcement will come out from the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. With respect to the human resources stream, uh, Lily Seek, who had been our HR partner and HR manager in the Department of Medicine for about 12 years, has transitioned to become the HR partner for shared services. Um, Kendra Brunt uh, has been appointed as the DOM HR partner, reporting to a senior partner within the set structure. And at this time, Erica Federu remains the sole department HR staff member uh, during the transition. At one point, we had seven individuals in the DOM HR team, and uh, Erica is the, the, the sole remaining individual. Several uh, faculty and staff items have transitioned to shared services, and there's the link that has been provided in the chat with respect to uh, further information that you can find with respect to the SET, um, the SET initiative. In the area for finance, uh, Len Wong, who had also been with the department for a number of years, uh, has transitioned to become the senior finance partner for the College of Applied Sciences. Um, and we are currently awaiting to announce, although it's been uh, identified that we do have um, a dedicated finance partner. Um, but again, those will be finalized at the college and faculty levels, and then a formal announcement will come out. With respect to the other streams, external engagement, which uh, Andrea, who's uh, helping assist with this particular event and all of the department events and communications and various other pieces, uh, that area is currently under review through the set structure. Um, we have voiced significant concerns regarding staffing levels in this area. Currently, there are uh, event planners, if you will, but they're associated with alumni relations only. So uh, we are definitely going to have to push for additional resources there, and that's uh, a goal for sure. In terms of research administration, this is also currently being reviewed. One of the areas with respect to the SET initiative is that they need to fill the senior uh, positions first, and then those senior individuals get involved in the hiring of 
uh, the individuals that would be reporting to them. So uh, some of the senior individuals in research administration have been identified, identified and recently announced, but the impacts to the Department of, of Medicine are yet to be determined. Then we have the division academic admin support who are also impacted by SET and um, during this time, what we have done as a department is that we have undertaken vacancy management. So basically when an individual leaves their role as an academic admin assistant, uh, we do not fill that role on the university side. This has resulted in a reduction from 42 academic admins to our current level of 29, which is a decrease of 31%. And we're currently reaching critical levels to maintain appropriate support during the remainder of the transition. While we do continue to expect um, further uh, separations in that people might find jobs elsewhere within the university structure. <clears throat> so what does this mean? Um, just the doctors I know are incredibly stressed and, and exhausted based on COVID. With respect to the admin staff, we had the clinical transition of activities to AHS and now with SET, um, the morale is, is not incredibly high either for the admin staff. Um, what most individuals need to do is they have to provide an expression of interest and basically means apply for roles within SET. Um, many set positions have, have been evaluated at lower compensation rates for similar types of work. And the staff have the knowledge that the university administration is pushing for a 3% salary rollback as well. Current and future disruptions continue uh, for individuals and work teams, which also impacts the morale of the individuals. So uh, obviously this uh, equals a high level of frustration, anxiety, and stress. But I just wanna give a great shout out to the DOM staff who are here because they have done an amazing job and um, are, are continuing with their efforts and commitment to the department. Um, this one uh, is just our, what we were, were going to be doing was a return to campus update. Um, we were hoping that staff would actually begin uh, coming back on a phased approach uh, this past Monday, uh, past Tuesday. Unfortunately, with the announcement from the Alberta government on Friday afternoon and the subsequent communication from the university over the weekend, um, we will ha have to keep you informed about that. But I would like to thank everybody uh, again for their patience and continued flexibility in this area. I do have one other quick thing that I just wanna uh, let everybody know simply because it may impact anybody who travels between um, South Campus and, um, and the Bay Enterprise Square Station. Um, historically, the one card could be used for, uh, for the pass so that you didn't have to pay for um, using the LRT uh, between those stops. Uh, right now, that agreement between the university and the city has expired. So if you do use the um, LRT between those stops, uh, please do pay, otherwise you run the risk of being fined. So I just wanted to let everybody know that as well. Thank you. Thanks, Francois. I don't know if uh, that's still true on the AHS side, because there used to be an agreement for AHS employees as well. So we were going to um, just spend a minute talking about what's next, but I think most of everything has been covered. I, uh, I, I Honestly, I don't know what's next. Um, we will fasten our seatbelts, see what's to come, continue moving forward. But most importantly, um, there is a question in the chat box about what we can do to support our admin staff. And I think that goes all around is what we can do is just take some time to show kindness, support, and, and really help each other out right now. You know, things are not perfect. Um, we know that um, we could be doing so much, you know, more and already within this, this uh, pandemic, we are showing such amazing um, growth and potential and so on. But um, I think we just, we have to be patient and kind to each other. So with that, it's nine o'clock. Thank you for um, tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you every week, uh, virtually for now. 
Um, have a wonderful weekend, everybody, and thanks. And also, you can send me questions if you need to. I'm happy to answer them. Yeah.